Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I'm Matt Garrismovich, a PhD student in Russian lit, and this week apparently the only co-host who drinks the proper amount of water every day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and as Matt alluded to, I'm Cameron Lalana, and yes, I have just found out how much water I'm supposed <laughs> to drink on a daily basis. Uh, I'm shocked that I'm alive. Like it used to be, I used to drink like one carbonated water a day, like a can size, twelve ounce, and be like, that's probably enough for like months on end. And it just you're basically a succulent at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Sunlight, very little bit of water, he'll keep living. <laughs> My emotions are roughly on that level, too, so it actually fits really well. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. This is a podcast where me and my good pal Cameron get to unwind from our week with some Russian literature and a drink or two. This week, we're going to be reading Anton Chekhov's The Lady with the Dog. But before we get into our show, we'd like to extend a big thank you to our newest patron, Larkin. If you're interested in helping out the show, like Larkin, take a look at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. We have a lot of fun Patreon-only content and rewards, and it really helps the show out. If you're not interested in Patreon, but you would prefer to support us in a more, well, free way, you can leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts or sign up for our email list on our website. Yes, thank you for the updates, but before we get into the reading, the most important question of the day, Matt, what are you drinking? I'm going to give my cop-out answer per usual, <laughs> but it's not a cop-out answer when you understand how much solace it brings me. It's just a Jack and Coke. So simple, so elegant. <laughs> so drinkable. So drinkable. <laughs> <laughs> I know I was drinking it last week, but, you know, it's just so easy. Just works. Just works. What are you drinking this week? Uh, this week I'm going a bit off the beaten path because I uh, was clearing up my cabinets and... Um, oh boy. I was clearing up my cabinets on a Friday night when I was drinking with my roommates is what I mean to say. Sure. But we opened up an old bottle of uh, an old bottle of ice wine I have, so mm. I need to finish that off. So today I'm drinking uh, Inniskillen ice wine of a 2017 vintage. So it's vintage from four years ago? <laughs> <laughs> I think any years for wine is a vintage. I don't understand wine, so <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Uh, ice wine is like the, they pick them when the berries are early. Grapes are kind of frozen, so it produces a lot less juice, but it, it's much much sweeter. Mm. Uh, so it's like it's kind of like drinking a Coke. Honestly, it's really sure. really sweet. It's good. I would recommend it. They're sure. expensive as hell. This was a gift, so thank you, Rob. I don't normally say names in this show, but Rob isn't his name. That's just what we call him, and it's caused him endless consternation through the years. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's get into talking about Anton Chekhov. And the lady. And the dog. Let's talk about it all. Less so the dog. Less so the dog. Yeah, you know, I don't have much to say about the dog, but we can talk about the lady. And we can talk about Chekhov, I guess, too, a little bit. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the background of the story. As I was perusing... The interwebs. I took issue with a lot of the characterization of the story because this was a story that it takes place in Yalta and Chekhov wrote it while he was in Yalta. And so there are, are critics that say, you know what, this is clearly about Chekhov himself because, you know, think about it, Yalta. And I said, that could be the dumbest thing I have ever heard in my entire life. Uh, just <laughs> it's because the, the action of the story takes place in a city in which uh, he, he was living. But I digress. Uh, so, so the lady with the dog. It's it takes place in Yalta, as I've mentioned, and some critics say that this bears some sort of resemblance to Chekhov himself and his life because he he fell in love with an actress while he was living in Yalta in approximately 1899 when this story was published, and there are some other very vague passing similarities that I I don't really think bear that much on the story. Personally, I don't, I don't know how you felt about it when you're doing kind of the background research, but I thought it was kind of mm -hmm. kind of thin to draw any biographical connection on this one. Yeah, the biographical connections I found seem pretty tenuous. The only ones that I found even kind of interesting were people arguing for intellectual or literary influences mm -hmm. or connections, which I found a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, a bit more relevant, I think. Yeah. So background on Chekhov, I, I don't have a lot to talk about because I think the story, again, this is one of those that really stands on its own. It's probably one of his most famous ones. And the fact that this is a short story is somewhat significant. Chekhov being one of the masters of the short story, that was one of the things. Short stories and plays are really what he's known for. And this is one of said short stories. 
Yes. It's hard to understate his effect on plays. You and I, live. we lived in Russia for four months, and I cannot think of a single day that I did not see a poster for one of his plays being put on at some point. Mm -hmm. The Cherry Orchard or Uncle Vanya, whatever. There was always a play of his going on somewhere. Mm -hmm. Also, an entire line of beers named after him. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Yeah, <laughs> that's the most <laughs> important one for us. I would pay for us to import those <laughs> for a larger Chekhov episode if we could find them. The year-long Chekhov series. <laughs> <laughs> Vasily Ostrovsky Island, get in contact with me. Please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what happens in The Woman and the Dog? The story itself is, as Matt has alluded to, based in, at least initially, in Yalta. We join Dmitry Dmitryich Gurov, who's been there in Yalta for about two weeks, uh, and he's just bored out of his mind, really. And one day when he's sitting and watching New Arrivals, he happens to see a woman who he describes as a fair-haired young lady of medium height wearing a beret uh, with a white Pomeranian dog running behind her. First of all, not a cute dog. I gotta say it. <laughs> I really hate to hate on dogs, but Pomeranian... <laughs> Just not my favorite, but, you know, we'll see. I've seen some people translate the title as um, the woman with the lap dog, which I think is less less literary, but a bit funnier, and I almost prefer it. Yeah, I mean, well, it's it's like the diminutive form of dog, so it's like, I've seen it translated as the little dog, which could also be correct. I don't really think it matters, <laughs> Yeah, personally. Yeah, no, just, it's just funny to me. Yeah. yeah, I don't think there's any actual reflection in the story, but yeah, so in the days following that, he happens to see her multiple times a day, always alone, always with the same beret, always with the same white dog. And he begins to call her simply the lady with the dog. And he thinks, well, she doesn't have a husband. She doesn't seem to have friends. So, eh, you know, wouldn't be bad to make her acquaintance. Make her acquaintance. Wink, wink, <laughs> wink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and on that particular subject, we find a little bit more about Kurov, which is that he does not care much about his children. He, he notes that he has them. And then he goes on for several sentences, or at least... Internally, this is the description about him, about how much he doesn't like his wife, <laughs> who is a tall, erect woman with dark eyebrows, uh, who considered herself an intellectual, and, and he considers her unintelligent, narrow, and inelegant. <laughs> but he's also afraid of her and does not like to be at home. <laughs> so he's he's re, he's re taken that energy and reapplied it into just hating women. He, he calls them the lower race. Despite that, he cannot go on without the quote-unquote lower race. He feels he's natural in the company of women. And of course, given that he hates his wife and that he is obsessed with women, it's perhaps no surprise that he carries on many, many affairs. And he reflects at this time that you know, affairs are nice. They're so exciting until they just keep happening. And then what's a light and charming adventure, that's a direct quote, grows into a regular problem of extreme inter intricacy. Really hard to be an adulterer. Guys, it gotta... really i mean it's just exhausting you know you see a lady and you're like you know you're trying to just have an affair and all of a sudden like you know oh she's got a husband and you have a wife that's just crazy it's it, really hard to imagine <laughs> that something like that could become very complex <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this continues until one day uh, the lady with the dog happens to sit down at the next table over from him in the gardens her expression gait dress and the way her hair was done told him that she was very bored I guess in Russian society, you probably would, you would learn to read things like that. And he notes that everyone who talks about Yalta as being this place of great immorality is, is just making things up. And frankly, if the people are telling those stories, they A, don't know what really goes on in Yalta, which is much more boring than that. And B, they actually want to do it themselves, frankly. But even though he, he despises those kinds of stories, he can't help but think of them when she sits down next to him. He thinks of Trips to the Mountains, a swift, fleeting love affair. And he really cannot <laughs> emphasize enough, fleeting love affair. <laughs> <laughs> and so he begins to talk with her. And they, they have this kind of awkward conversation where he offers a bone to her dog and asks her, how long has she been in Yalta? And it's really a very awkward conversation. Halfway through, they just stop talking. And, and there's a brief silence before she declares, time here goes so fast and yet it's so dull. I'm so bored. He kind of chastises her and says, That's only the fashion to say it is dull here. A provincial will live in Belya or Gidra and not be dull. And when he comes here, it's, Oh, the dullness. Oh, the dust. One would think he came from Grenada. And then after like that, they kind of, they strike up a friendship. And they, they begin to hang together more often. And there's a long scene, well, long, long for this story, a paragraph, really, which really describes them going about telling each other about their lives, Gaurav telling himself about her life, and at the very end of a long paragraph of him talking about himself, he learns that her name is Anna Sergeyevna. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to mention that, actually. <laughs> During this, he begins to think, and he begins to associate her with his daughter, 
uh, in that she's young and she's got angularity. I don't know what that means, but uh, an angularity manifest in her laugh and manner of talking with the stranger. Is that is that the translation thing or? Well, OK, I, I'm not sure exactly. I just wanted to say I didn't I, I didn't like how she was compared with his daughter. It gave me I, it gave, <laughs> I didn't like it. I'll just say, say the least. It was a little, a little too much. Yeah, it. I, mm, yeah, that one, that one really rubbed me the wrong way, uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> so he, really, the most physical description of get we get of her is that she's got a slender, delicate neck and lovely gray eyes. And then one night when he's falling asleep, he thinks there's something pathetic about her and falls asleep. <laughs> That's how part one ends. Romantic stuff. Yep. Following that, they they continue to have an acquaintance until until one day when they are just waiting for a steamer to arrive and watch people disembark. That's how exciting their lives are here. Uh, and once <laughs> the, it does arrive and everyone disembarks, they kind of have a short, meaningless conversation. And suddenly he takes her and kisses her on the lips. She kind of looks around to see if anyone's noticed them. And then they decide to go to his hotel room, at which point he it is implied they sleep together. But really, we mostly focus on Gaurav's thoughts as we go through this process of, um, you know, what kind of women there are in the world. And, you know, there are you know many good natured, careless women who are unlike the unreflecting, domineering, unintelligent women like his wife. Uh, he's really coming off well adjusted here. Oh, yeah. Big time. Uh, yeah, big time. Um, and, and then after that, she kind of Anna Sergeyevna really gets very distraught. She she begins to to say, you must despise me now. I, I'm, I'm a sinner. And and Gaurav, when when she's going through this breakdown, does not care. While she's crying, he there is a watermelon which he cuts and begins to eat. And then there's a half hour of silence. I presume he's eating up the watermelon the whole time <laughs> because it says he begins eating it without haste. So <clears throat> okay, so here okay, just for when I want to yeah. break in and just say like, it's not like okay, would it have been less sympathetic if he was eating like some grapes or even like an apple? <laughs> Maybe yeah. the thing with the watermelon it is such a process because I guess it okay maybe it was already pre sliced but I'm envisioning this man cutting a whole watermelon which he then has to eat and watermelons got seeds so you got to be spitting out the seeds somewhere along this way while this girl is having just a full on breakdown next to you <laughs> just <laughs> it's a lot yeah and then after a half full half hour. He finally says, well, how could I despise you? She says, oh, God, forgive me. It's awful. And he's like, you seem to feel that you need to be forgiven. Uh, and then she goes on to keep saying, no, I'm, I'm a low, bad woman, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Gaurav keeps listening to her and says, you know, notes that he's already bored and says, I just don't understand. And and she continues on like that for, for quite a while until finally she has she is, she is done. And he kind of looks her in the eyes and kisses her and speaks affectionately to her. And they both begin to laugh. So they go out, go to the sea, and while they're going out to Orianda, he asks her, I happen to notice your surname, Von Dieteritz. Is your husband a German? And she says, no, not a German, but he is an Orthodox Russian. And then they go and they have a nice day. They reflect on nature until they, they, they go back home and have more kisses and, and just like have a, a quiet day together, kind of getting over the, the morning's emotions of Anna Sergeyevna's guilt over the whole thing. As Anna Sergeyevna's hu- husband begins to come... They kind of make plans to begin apart until suddenly she gets a letter, which is that he's ill and he needs her to come to him. And she says, you know, OK, good. We're, we, we're going to say goodbye. It's it's good that I'm going. Actually, it's the finger of destiny. When they're when they're parting ways, she says, look at me once more. I shall remember you. I shall think of you. Don't remember evil against me. And, and Gaurav is already not thinking about her. Uh, he <laughs> <laughs> he thinks that many people have known him past this stage. And, and frankly, no one's really happy with him after that part. So this is pretty cool that he can. He can just take off like this. Except, bum bum bum, when he gets back to Moscow, he finds he can't stop thinking about her. No matter what is going on, his normal life, working at the bank, reading three newspapers a day, and then denying that he reads any Moscow papers, hanging out with professors and and doctors and lawyers, and no matter what he's doing, he can't not think of Anna Sergeyevna. Is it me, or is he like big-time IR major turned uh, consultant? (laughs) Oh, Oh, three thousand percent. Like hundred percent. Yeah. He's super. You know, he's like super annoying. He's like, oh yeah, I only read like physical newspaper though. You know, like the Financial Times. <laughs> like, oh my god, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I try to get both sides. I read the Wall Street Journal and the New York <laughs> Times. Uh, <laughs> he is. He's just in love with Anna Sergeyevna. He's, he's coming to realize. And his wife, who I guess has known this whole time, says to him. 
the part of a lady killer does not suit you at all, Dimitri. Uh, notably, she uses the Dimitri, not Dimitri, which earlier in the story it's noted that she never says to him. And, and then he decides, you know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go see Anna Sergeyevna. So he books a train to St. Petersburg, or at least the provincial town outside of Petersburg, where she's staying. And he's like, I'm going to go see her. And then after he goes to her house and realizes, wow, it's actually pretty creepy. I would, I, I can't, well, he doesn't realize that. He realizes it would be, it would be a bad look for me to knock on, on the door with where she and her husband live. Plus there's a giant gate and dogs outside. So I guess maybe I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So instead he takes the rational course of action, which is to wait out there for hours and hours waiting to see if she leaves until she does it. And, and he goes back to his hotel room and he feels defeated. Everything feels gray. Uh, he, he's just he's just confounded of what he should do next until he remembers she likes Japanese perfume. And so he decides, you know, the geisha, that's a play that's going on. I'm going to go watch it. I bet she's going to be there, which is some tenuous logic, but it turns out that he's right. Well, it's opening night. I mean, actually, I will say this is one of the few moments of clarity he has, which is like, <laughs> if you're an aristocrat in provincial Russia, you're probably going to the opening night of your play. That's fair. That makes sense. And he totally nails it on that one. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He nails it. He sees Anna Sergeyevna and her husband, who, as he enters the room, is bowing to everyone. When they were having carrying on their active affair in Yalta, she called him a flunky. And he realizes, yeah, she's right about that. Uh, <laughs> and he notes his, his smile was sugary, and in his buttonhole, there was a badge of some distinction, like the number on a waiter. Once her husband goes away to smoke, he pops in and says good evening and she reacts as you'd expect which is badly uh and then she kind of pulls him out and they go to a, a quieter area in the in in the theater and she interrogates him on why he's come and he's like don't you understand i i'm, I'm in love with you and she says go away at once i beseech you by all that is sacred i implore you there are people coming a as she kind of she still holds on to him she says okay fine I'll, I'll come see you in moscow i have never been happy and i am miserable now and i shall never ever be happy never don't make me suffer more. I swear I'll come to Moscow, but now let us part. My precious, good, dear one, we must part, which is some mixed signals. And we come to part four, where we jump forward to the future, where Anna Sergeyevna begins coming to Moscow to see him. Once in every two or three months, she tells her husband she's going to go consult a doctor about an internal complaint, and her husband believed her and did not believe her. She stays in the uh, Slavyansky Bazaar Hotel, and she happens to see uh, Gurov there. And finally, one night, they kind of have... A, a conversation where she begins to cry in a, a, an echo of the first time they'd slept together. And he thinks, uh, you know, let her cry it out. I'll sit down and wait. And this time he sits down and drinks tea while she cries. And he thinks upon what their lives have become now. Their life has become hard for both of them. They can only meet in secret and they must hide themselves from people like, like thieves. Was their life not shattered? And it's evident to him that, you know, this is not going to end. And, and there's nothing for them to do but go forward. And he reflects on how he has become so much older. And he's in his 40s at this point. And he's thinking on how he loses. He's lost his good looks. And eventually he kind of says, don't cry, my darling. You've had your cry. That's enough. Let us talk now. Let us think of some plan. They begin to talk about what they could do. <clears throat> and it seemed, quote, as though in a little while the solution would be found. And then a new and splendid life would begin. And it was clear to both of them that they still had a long, long road before them. And that the most complicated and difficult part of it was just beginning. Stop crying, he says. <laughs> I'm tired of you crying, he says. You've had your cry now. Can you please stop, he says. I'm eating a watermelon. Does this not cheer you up? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm drinking tea now because I'm sensitive to your breakdown. <laughs> I'm meditative. I'm letting you cry without helping you, but I'm meditating on what you're crying about this time. <laughs> <laughs> so okay you mentioned that he was able to divine based on her like mm. hairstyle and whatnot that she was she was bored at the cafe and there right. was all this okay so my thing with this one is like <laughs> it's so incredibly told from his point of view i think a lot of the things are maybe they're right but i think they're what he wants to be right uh and and so i think he wants to believe a lot of this, there, there's a couple lines that I marked. He had some thoughts that I thought had to belong to him, even if they're told from the third person point of view. He has this one that I was just like, okay. Uh, he says, there's something attractive and elusive in his appearance, in his character, and in his whole nature, which predisposed women to him and drew them to him. He knew it. And some kind of power drew him to them as well. <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of power, some kind of power of horniness draws me too. <laughs> <laughs> he has this other one um when he's talking about like the different yeah. types of women where where he says in the um 
The carefree women who enjoyed having love affairs were grateful to him for some happiness, even if it was very short lived. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Made me laugh. Yeah. I mean, because that's interesting. There's a moment of, of self-awareness later on where he does say that eventually the longer love affairs I've carried on, they realize that I'm not who I portrayed myself was at the beginning. And they still loved me after that. But none of them were happy with me after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I was kind of reading some, doing some secondary reading, there is a piece by Robert Fulford that I that I liked, which is about the, the way in which life becomes reconceptualized after falling in love. And I think you start to kind of see a little bit of self-awareness th towards the, the ending of it. Self-awareness and just like, you know, you don't have to be the same person that you've always been. Yeah, no, I think I agree. I was going to actually kind of talk about the same arc. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. we're kind of in a four arc structure uh, of the build up. And then, as you pointed out, almost the breakdown of, of exactly what has been teed up at the beginning of the story, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of things later on are, are in very specific opposition to things that have been said earlier, such as you saying that, oh, he's got this this nature that women are drawn to. And in the end, he says, I'm getting old. My looks are fading. My hair is going gray. I don't have a, this lust for life that I've had before, mm -hmm. which very much comes after some point in falling in love, which... I kind of tied to there's a scene in part two where when she he and Anna are looking out at the sea at Orianda, he kind of has a moment of thinking about death. Yeah. Yeah. The, like the, the, the trees and grasshoppers and the, and the monotonous sound of the sea kind of rises up, overtakes him. And he kind of thinks that this must be what it sounded like when there was no Yalta nor Orianda and when all sound was indifferent and monotonous and we are all no more. And he kind of begins to think about death. He says, sitting beside a young woman who seemed so lovely, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, made him think about that. And it's interesting that's not he's not sitting next to Anna, not any particular characteristic about her, but it's sitting next to a young person who is making him think about his own death, which is that with the added complication that he's also following in love with her at the same time. What do you think about the the, the scenery of it? Like the the Yalta-ness of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know if I had anything specifically about Yalta. I think that the character like the features of nature are really interesting, mm -hmm. such as uh, like the the moment I noticed a shift in the story, I would say, or even the first time I went through, this was really sticks out to me when he goes beyond thinking of himself as kind of almost immortal, right? Mm -hmm. Women want me. I'm getting exactly what I want. Uh, you know, my wife is mad at me for some reason. This is the first moment of real self-reflection I see. The in in the self-reflection happens because of the the place of of where they are, of of the nature around them, which is so much bigger. And having a moment to reflect that. And in, in the indifference towards the life and depth of every individual, of the unceasing movement towards perfection, you know, that made him feel very, very small. And I, I think that that kind of relationship of, of, of people and nature is a really interesting feature that does keep popping up, although most obviously for me right there. What were mm -hmm. you thinking about it? I was thinking not as intellectually about it. Just <laughs> <laughs> I like your thought, though. For me, <laughs> I was just kind of thinking the way that Yalta functions to take them out of their, their everyday life. Mm. Right. It like it almost doesn't exist as as a function in the story. It's like completely out of the Moscow, Petersburg, provincial, any sort of dynamic. It's just kind of over here, outside of everything, and it kind of allows for this out of time self reflection in a way. And then there are also a few parallels to Anna Karenina, if you could say the least. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about that a lot. I I mm -hmm. didn't want to be the first one to say it, but uh, as long as we're on that subject. Chekhov was very influenced by Tolstoy, and regardless of whether or not he was influenced by him, I think around this time, he was only writing this maybe about 20 or 15 or 20 years after Anna Karenina was published. Regardless of the distance between when Anna Karenina was published and when you are writing in Russia, you cannot escape the fact that if you name your character Anna, you are going to invite some comparisons, I think. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. just like... It's just so ingrained in the literary history. I mean, if you were to point to one book that you were like, this is the book, I mean, that's kind of the one. It's super important as far as literary history goes. Like, um, <laughs> impossible mm -hmm. to say how important it is. And so you get Anna, first name. Uh, she's Sergeyevna, patronymic. And Anna Karenina, her son was Serioja. Uh, or Sergei, and the patronymic is derived from that, so you get that sort of thing. And so I think that's a, it's, I mean, it's also Chekhov's story of adultery, so I mean, you're really inviting the parallel. There's no way that that's uh, unintentional. Yeah. Uh, and even if it was, 
too bad we're going to talk about it because <laughs> you've done it and you should know better yeah i mean regardless of his intent it, it's definitely we do know that he did love anna karenina he did mm -hmm. have a very complicated relationship with tolstoy certainly i think he, he found tolstoy very interesting and whether or not he eventually kind of broke with tolstoy intellectually is, mm -hmm. is a matter of some debate but definitely he engages with tolstoy's themes re regardless of whether or not he agrees with them uh in his work i think i read somewhere i forget who uh, put forth the idea that this tale is a re a sort of Chekhovian rewrite of Anna Karenina where instead of you know Tolstoy in the end is kind of moralizing there is a reason why she has such a bad end mm -hmm. uh, he wants to he wants to rewrite Anna a character who he reportedly was was just enraptured with uh to give her a better ending not an easier mm -hmm. ending a, a an ending that's just as difficult as Anna Karenina proper but one that has is open and ended enough to invite the possibility of happiness or the happiness that they kind of feel instead of following through the end and knowing that it doesn't end like that. I would agree with that. I think there's one thing that I picked up on a lot, which if you're looking at it from today, you might kind of roll your eyes and be like, oh, it's too obvious. But it's the motif of the color gray, which keeps mm -hmm. recurring. I mean, I marked every time it recurred and I counted at least 10 instances in a 12 page story. And I think it's symbolically representing this idea of moral relativity in the story, which Chekhov is, well, I'll say first, I, I agree that it is in some form a sort of rewrite. Uh, in, in that instance, I think that he's writing it in a way in which he wants to show uh, a, a more relative story than what Tolstoy is writing. It's a little bit complicated because I think Tolstoy wrote uh, one thing with the intent of showing one thing, and he, ex he, he actually wrote something much more complicated than he <laughs> intended to write. <laughs> Uh, I think there's a lot of scholarship that would argue Tolstoy is not a particularly good reader of his own writing, which is possible to do. And I mean, I wish I like that was the case for me. I wish I was like better at doing things than I thought. But no. <laughs> um, I mean, Anna's eyes are gray. The fence outside of her house, it's gray. She wears um, Dimitri's favorite gray dress. Um, there's like all sorts of things in which it shows up in every point of the story. It's just like... You don't even really have to be reading that attentively to pick up on it. Yeah. Gray. Gray. <laughs> I mean, how do you... I, I, I know you haven't read a ton of Anna Karenina yet, but how, how, are you, how are you coming down on that on that opinion, on that stance? <laughs> I feel like I'm not far enough in to really have a definitive opinion, but mm -hmm. okay, regardless of whether or not we want to we wanna cast that intention on Chekhov, I think it's entirely possible to read it just in our own, like, the way we interpret literature in the world. I think it's completely possible to read this as such, mm -hmm. uh, given the parallels in that... Say, for example, in the very end of the story, when Anna Sergeyevna is coming to Moscow in order to see a doctor, uh, as, I, as I said before, her husband believed her and did not believe her uh, in the same way that although uh, Gurov's wife never really asks what's going on, she seems to basically know what's happening here. So we have the same kind of situation where you have in, in, in a Karenina where, well, the one significant other in Karenina's case is like half aware, not really wanting to believe in, in the same way that Karenin is a careerist, although that, that element is not so leaned on. He's certainly a, an official in the government who is focused on trying to maintain his status in addition to his personal feelings. Anna Sergeyevna's husband is is a very unsympathetic portrayal of Karenin almost. He's a pure, pure careerist who is, you know, uh, he's, he's German and therefore his grandfather probably would have been a German Lutheran faith. However, he himself is a Russian Orthodox which may indicate that he's, you know, trying to become more acceptable to this society. So he's letting go of, of things which are might not be acceptable to that society. So I, I think, you know, there are a fair number of numbers of parallels, which you don't even have to have to have read in a Karenina to understand. But even regardless of that, just like the same situation of, of this, like knowing and not knowing is set up. And we're really in that like moment of like what happens next. But instead of Anna Sergeyevna acting like Anna and, and kind of revealing it to to her husband, she is just like Anna, aware of the precarious position she's in, and that, uh, as as uh, is said in the '67 film, and I presume in the film in in the original book as well, uh, the law is written by husbands and fathers. It's not even yeah. Like one of the interesting parts of the story is the fact that Gurov he has a wife, but she plays absolutely no role because he's able to just kind of go off and do whatever he feels like. Anna, not so much. I mean, she's able to get away eventually, and you know say she's going to see a doctor and, and whatnot. But her husband is still a, a character in the story physically, whereas for Gura, his wife is kind of just, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a passing mention, like, eh, you know, the old ball chain just kind of, eh, she's there. But I don't know. 
Kind of just hold me back from all my affairs. <laughs> all my affairs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that is an interesting... I don't think this was intended in any way in Chekhov's uh, uh, mind, but clearly we've already indicated we don't necessarily care about what Chekhov intended. That's right. Take that, Chekhov. <laughs> <laughs> um, if we, when I was when I was watching Anna Karenina, and as I've been reading Anna Karenina, I can't stop thinking about the play A Doll's House. I don't know if you've ever read or, or watched that. Nope. Uh, it's, <laughs> uh, gosh, it's. Uh, I shouldn't have brought this up without thinking about it. It's a Nordic play, I think Norwegian, but I could be wrong. One of the three. Uh, which is about a woman who realizes that she doesn't love her husband and she needs to to leave him. And, you know, the major conflict is is him trying to, like, be like, you know, aren't we in love? And her being like, no, we've never been in love. I've always been, a, a, you know, a small force who is fitting the thing you want. And, and the play ends with her leaving him and her children. And that's a big plot point, that she's leaving behind her children to go be whatever she's going to be. And I, I think it's really interesting in instances like this, in this particular case, we we have uh, an interesting, I mean, maybe not interesting, perhaps it's not even all that enlightening, just the juxtaposition of Gaurav in roughly the same position with the addition, with the addition of an affair whose family is, is such a small character in his life that it, it warrants barely any mention. The idea of him abandoning them is, is, isn't even touched upon or the effects of that. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters, how his mistress reminds him of his daughter, uh, which is completely unremarked upon. It has, it, it, I guess... Parallels of, of patriarchy and society, which um, I, I guess are not all that interesting or enlightening, but certainly hard to ignore from a modern perspective. Or even, frankly, not even from a modern perspective. A Doll's House was written, I think, concurrently with this. So <laughs> even from a <laughs> contemporary perspective. Yeah, I just feel like this guy's got, he's got a lot of kids to be just like hanging out in Yalta for an extended period of time. But I guess that's what you, you were able to do in like the 1890s. <laughs> yeah. I'm oh, sorry. A Doll's House is written over 20 years before this one, so okay. <laughs> the ideas in Doll's House are have precede this by over 20 years, but whatever. <laughs> I guess this isn't meant to be. It's not necessarily fair to discount him on the fact that his feminist creds aren't good, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the ladies do love him. So really, what can you say? Yeah, I know. he's such an he's such an attractive man between the couple of months when the story begins and the story ends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I think that is done with some self-awareness, especially given its subversion later. But yeah, mm-hmm. definitely your point earlier that some statements which were made purely in the third person are clearly re- reflected by Gaurav's actual thought process. Oh, big time. There's no way that <laughs> that everyone thinks the things that he's thinking about himself. I mean, I guess they eat just enough for him to, to justify that continued thought to himself. Maybe. So the last point I have is on the difference between public and private life, slightly. And there's this line that I like towards the very end, which is that he had two lives. One was the public one, which was visible to everybody who needed to know about it, but was full of conditional truth and deceit. And, well, really, I guess I really wanted to focus on the public one. Uh, The idea of conditional truth and deceit, that being the one which everybody sees, and he kind of feels like there's a complete inversion of what he would actually want. Where towards the end of the story, he kind of feels, I don't want to say like complete, but he feels true to himself when he's with Anna Sergeyevna, that's not the life that anybody sees. Instead, they see this one that is full of characteristics, which is no longer how he identifies. And it's an interesting inversion by the end to show the, I don't know, I guess like the the, the difficulties that they're going to face going forward, which remain unresolved, which is, I think, partially the point of this story. That is something that I really did like about it a lot, is that it, it didn't the action, the narrative isn't about the play out of what happens now. Frankly, we're in the least interesting part of it, the the initiation. For many books, really the point is the kind of the arc of what happens next, the dramatic tension that exists. And for Chekhov, that's not the important thing. It's uh, it, it, leaves, it leaves you with kind of a, a lot of possibilities. And when I was researching this, I read somewhere that uh, Novikov called this the greatest short story ever written. And, and frankly, I don't know... I don't know why this is true for every other thing we read that I find somewhere that Nabokov did call this the greatest X ever written in some category. I got to wonder how many of those things he kept thinking the next day. Because I think a lot of things are great and maybe the best when I read them or watch them for the first time. Then I go back to them like a week later and realize that they're <laughs> not as good as I remember. But that was just a small point of amusement for me. Yeah, I found this quote that Chekhov wrote in a letter. He's responding to somebody criticizing uh, i think the story or his work in general and he says you're right in demanding that an artist should take an intelligent attitude to his work 
but you confuse two things, solving a problem and stating a problem correctly. It is only the second, stating a problem correctly, that is obligatory for the artist. You wrote that in 1888, so presumably during the process of writing this, not yet published. And I think that's what this story does. It sets up what is the problem. It states the problem correctly. It doesn't solve the problem. You as the reader get to have the fun time of, <laughs> of solving the problem. Yeah, I think that's a good place to end it. Because uh, as we have not solved this problem, so too has the problem not been solved for Anna Sergeyevna and Dmitry Dmitriyich. R.I.P. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's kind of sweet in a way, I guess. I kind of, as a love story, it's obviously difficult, but uh, and and some criticisms to be laid at it. But uh, the story does it does kind of end up on, uh, I guess, a note which is kind of sweet, which is not the most intellectual thing I've said in the show, but you know. It just, I don't know, I felt very unresolved to me, which I mm. liked because I think it adds to the whole experience. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Before we totally wrap up, Cameron, on a scale from one to Yeltsin, how drunk are you? Well, uh, okay, so I, wish I, I would I would come up with a joke related to the story, but it's uh, actually really hard to drink a drink that's this sweet quickly, so I'm actually only at about a two or a three at this point because um, okay. it's just impossible short of shooting this, and I really can't. I really can't bring myself to shoot this because it's actually pretty thick just yeah. for, for textual reasons. But how about you, Matt? Where are you? Where have you landed? Uh, I think I'm about the dog in the story. Just kind of trotting <laughs> around by myself, you know, having a good time. <laughs> That's fair. Presumably just let go. Yeah, more or less. Some, yeah. Somewhere in the middle, I guess. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's never mentioned again. Because <laughs> it's never mentioned. <laughs> Poor dog. <laughs> okay, well, that's good to hear. Uh, what are we... As we have alluded to in the past, reading next week. Next week, we're starting our, our big boy read of the year, our first big boy read of the podcast. We are going to be starting our summer of Anna Karenina. We're going to be reading part one of the novel. We're going to be doing it over eight parts. That's right. You heard us eight parts. We're going to be releasing them every other week. So you'll have time to kind of catch up and read along with us, which I suggest you do. I suggest you join our discord. We're going to have some more info, some 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 chats about it we're gonna have a potentially a little bit of a book club going on so join our discord to stay up to date with that kind of stuff and uh i look forward to imparting some wisdom the best of my ability <laughs> about anna karenina yes and for those of you who find that a terrifying prospect like me uh every other <laughs> week will also be other content so yes we're that's not going to be eight solid weeks or in this case uh, 16 solid weeks of anna it's 16 weeks of a good amount of Anna and also just enough to, you know, have a nice, have a nice relaxing week uh, of us talking about warfare in between. <laughs> <laughs> We're not forgetting about our Soviet literature lovers. We've got some really good ones lined up during those other weeks. Yeah. And I've got one for all you uh, 1990s Chechen warheads out there. Oh, so, yeah. You know. I know there's a lot of you out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current patrons. We've got Jeff, Janice, Anne, Emily, Jesse, Madeline, Alex, Daniel, Paige, Darren, Larkin, Lou, Gary, Daniel, Jack, Alex, and Roland. Getting to the very end of my breath there. <laughs> <laughs> Podcasting isn't free, and grad school really doesn't pay very much. So, if you're interested in joining with our current patrons to keep the show running, take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or join our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon.